<laughs> and how long have you been there, John? Uh, a couple of years. I, I, uh, okay, I got on the plane in uh, uh, July 4th, 2009, <laughs> Independence Day. <laughs> you make it sound like it was just all of a sudden one day you got on a plane and moved to Australia. I did, seriously, I did. I just thought, oh, hey, no, it was a discount ticket. You know, I said, oh, okay, I can get down here for 700 bucks. All right, I'll do it. <laughs> Have you been back to the States? <laughs> yes, I, I did a really unusual thing. Um, last uh, winter, the Southern Hemisphere winter, uh, I went to a place called Singularity University. Have you ever heard of this? It's, no, it's in it Mountain View. It's, at, it's hosted at NASA Ames, right next to the Googleplex. And hmm. uh, uh, this futurist, a guy named Ray Kurzweil, and oh, yeah. Peter Diamandis, uh, who started the X Prize stuff, uh, got together and uh, they said they had picked the top 80 graduate students out of a pool of 1,600 applicants uh, to run this 10-week summer program that would study exponential technologies. And uh, so I, I sat wow. around with these uh, really kind of amazing minds gathered from all over the globe and tried to figure out uh, how to deal with the fact that uh, the computing technology is, you know, developing at an exponential rate, according to all of Kurzweil's research. You know, he keeps mentioning how when he first started working with computers, you know, it would take an entire office building to hold what is, you know, now inside one of these devices. You know, a million-fold increase in computing power and, and reduction in, in space. And that this trend is just going to continue. And uh, that uh, by his prediction, by about uh, 2035, 2045, I forgot now, that the computing will uh, reach a level of uh, human intelligence. So that's what the singularity of Singularity University refers to, this, this point where we have uh, uh, such smart machines that uh, they're, they become smarter than we are. And we don't know what happens after that. But we should start thinking about it now, just so we'll be ready, and taking advantage of all this technology to do interesting and important things like, you know, solving world hunger and, uh, well, we, we had uh, all of these uh, target projects uh, for our, our program, and, and they were, you know, things like water, hunger, poverty. You know, uh, we wanted to have one on education. Uh, but uh, the, the faculty hadn't sort of prepared for that, so they're doing education this, this time around. Um, when is that happening? It's, it's on right now. Uh, the, the, it's a 10-week it's a program during the, the summer there in, uh, in the States. Cool. Uh, Rob, I just want to let you know I muted you because we're getting typing noises. Please unmute whenever you want. I'm going to try and send through a link. What's the best uh, place to post a... Uh... Uh, I just tweeted uh, a link to the... I'll put it in the chat here. I, I in, couldn't in find the Google direct... chat? Are you capturing that chat, the, the one that's... If you click invite chat right on the bottom bar? There's the... no... It's not automatically archived, but okay. um, you can save it before you close the Hangout. Okay, great. Which I often forget to do. Well, that's where I've, I've just put the link to Singular to you. Ah, okay. I will, please, before we hang up, remind me, to, hey, save the chat. Okay. Rob, are you unmuted? Now I am. Okay. <laughs> no, I knew he, I thought, uh oh, I'm breathing too much or something. <laughs> no, just from our experiences the last two times, I know your you know my reputation. sensitivity of your ears. Yeah. <laughs> so, what were you typing? Uh, well, I was uh, typing. He had reshared my post. I can see here at two fourteen a.m. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've got a big echo chamber going oh, on here. Aren't you, and, oh shoot, Jeff, aren't you in Korea? Is that where you are? I am. Yeah, okay. Couldn't remember that. That's where I thought. Yeah. So have you guys done anything with a MOOC in this past week? Or just played with Google Plus? 
I made a, a, a big wiki to speech thing about you asked me to, to go through that theory uh, poplet. Mm -hmm. So I did Ooh. in wiki to speech. So Ooh. now there's a 33 slide presentation that talks all about learning theories uh, using some of these tools. So how's the whole wiki to speech thing going? This launched two weeks ago, didn't it? Three weeks uh, ago? Launched? Or I, I, I've when, been I, when I this. asked you on the first session, like, yes. how long has it been around, you said, oh, it just kind of started. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, the, the most recent implementation of it where uh, the – see, I started two years ago working on it from the perspective of uh, you could do anything. You could, you could talk. Uh, you could gesture. Uh, and now I've, I've boiled that down to – the kind of the only things the, the world are really ready for is text to speech because the the voice recognition isn't uh, sufficiently accurate <clears throat> that people get put off and the gesture is even worse uh, it, it's interesting to look at some of this stuff I mean you you heard about the Microsoft Connect uh, game no no mm. ah, you, you really should check it out it's an amazing idea but <coughs> unlike the Wii device you know, which you was had a, a sort of an accelerometer in it, and so you could you know play golf just by swinging your arm. With Connect, there's just a camera watching you, and so you just literally swing your arms, and it can detect the movement of your body physically and uh, animate a, a a character in the game to to play golf. Uh, so. You could potentially see applications for that, that, you know, you, you enter into a completely virtual world and do, you know, these sort of simulated experiments with things where you're just sort of standing in front of a television set with this Kinect device watching you, you know, moving your arms around and, you know, things are happening in the, in the virtual world. Uh, so if, uh, you know, we don't ultimately talk very much about this in, in EduMOOC, you know that part that says online learning today and tomorrow. Uh, th this is where the the whole singularity university and the perspective on you know computers are just going to get more and more powerful. Uh, you know, really is going to surprise people. Uh, it, it's going to be like the human genome project, which how, you know. It how used far to be, away are we from having a holodeck? It, exactly. This this what we're talking about is holodeck like behavior. Uh, in in our interactions with the computer, it, did you see the uh, the the Pranav mystery uh, TED talk about this thing called Sixth Sense? No. Uh, is is an MIT researcher who basically uh, had had rigged up a device that would hang on your your around your neck, like you might know, normally carry a snapshot camera or something like that. But this not only had a video camera in it, but it also had a little projector so that as you walked around the camera could detect you're making you know I'm taking a picture symbols and decide oh, okay I'll capture that image and then after you got a bunch of those images you could just walk up to a wall and say show me with your hands this is a you know a gesture that the device would recognize all the pictures would then be displayed projected against the wall by the little projector that's part of this device and then you could you know use essentially touch screen types of you know z you know zoom in and uh, you know shuffle them around and do all the things you would want to do to manipulate actual physical objects uh, in a completely you know virtual uh, or augmented reality kind of way um, so, John, do you have any idea what your day job is going to be in 10 years? <laughs> it, it's undoubtedly going to involve some of this, developing some of this crazy stuff. Because, uh, we're, we, you know, the, the phone, as we, we look at it today, has already got two cameras on it and uh, GPS and accelerometer. Uh, I mean, I'd go to a... a a monthly meeting of guys uh, who <laughs> are interested in Android stuff, and one of them, you know that that thing, that little game that used to play that's, that was sort of two uh, little tilting boards with a bunch of holes in it, and the, and the object was to turn some knobs to keep the ball from falling through the holes. 
It was it was called you know Tilt a Maze or something mm -hmm. like that. So what he did, he he took his mobile phone, and he connected it up so that the accelerometer in the phone would drive some little servo motors to make this puzzle tilt. And so now he's got an electronic version of this thing that uh, he, he posted all the instructions up on a site called Instructables. Have you ever heard of this? Yes. It, it's, it's where you can learn how to make all kinds of things and, and won the top toy competition. And, uh, but this is, this is where things are going. I mean, that, that hobbyists basically are going to be able to take this device and connect it up to other like electronic gadgetry and make all kinds of wild and fun things like uh, uh, just this last weekend at this unconference I went to uh, they had uh, all of the radio controlled uh, uh, flying and and driving and sailing things uh, it, have you have you played around with one of these little uh, you know two bladed helicopters that just kind of hovers and lands on your hand and and flies upside down and you know you can do all kinds of crazy things with it? I, I think I've it's seen those amazing. at conferences, right? Yeah, no, it's it's all this yeah. radio controlled stuff that um, I mean I haven't gotten into it myself, but uh, it, it just amazes me as you know what what people are figuring out how to do it. I, there's a guy here in Auckland who his goal is to have a boat that will self-propel and navigate itself around New Zealand. So, you know, he, he figures he can't build a Predator drone that will go flying <laughs> off somewhere because it'll crash and he'll lose all his gear. But a boat, at least, you know, even if it completely runs out of power, at least it's going to still be floating out there in the ocean someplace and he can go rescue it. <laughs> but, but meanwhile, he's, he's, he's sorting out how, how to program this thing up so that it'll know where it is, it'll know how to go where it needs to go, and, you know, one day he's just going to launch it and it'll go and, you know, collect research data or whatever. And uh, it, 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 people are really getting empowered by so, this technology to do it yourself in really astonishing ways. Um, uh, the, 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 the really surprising one to me that I learned about at this Singularity University is, uh, is all the genetic stuff. You, do you know you can do your own sort of homebrew uh, genetic testing? Oh, that sounds dangerous. It is. It's wild. I mean, it's, you, you, you put the stuff through this little kit that you can get, you know, a DIY genome stuff and... Uh, we're we're going to see some really unusual discoveries made by by people that are out there just tinkering around using all of this new technology to uh, visualize and interpret data about things that you know we just never had it, the ability to access before. It was just you know cost too much or you know was too difficult, and kind of now you can do it in your you know your kitchen sink. So is that all happening there in Australia? That was mostly that happening in Southern California. That was that okay. was uh, right. you know uh, Mountain View and, and San Jose. But you know, frankly, we've got smart people all over the globe playing around with this stuff. How and much are you doing it? global collaboration? How much do you work with people in your time zone or on your island? And how much are you <laughs> working globally during the day? Uh, the um, Objective I have is is to be working around the clock. Yeah, you know, basically to have somebody on the projects that I'm interested in all the time. Uh, and I haven't gotten there yet, but I've uh, certainly had significant communications with people in you know Africa and South America and uh, early on a collaborator in Norway and. Uh, um, are the institutions supporting this, or are they a little hesitant to lose their edge, or their competitive edge? You know, the thing I'm finding, I, working in the academic institution that I do, uh, scholarship is, a, is historically or traditionally a, a solo endeavor. I mean, it, it, unless you have, have your established, you know, sort of team of researchers to to do a project, uh, you know, and you're all going to get your, your names on the paper. Um, 
Yeah, for a, mm -hmm. a, a, a PhD student is, is supposed to go off and do their own, you know, literature review and, uh, you know, ultimately be the, the one who writes the dissertation. And uh, so I, I haven't had much in the way of support uh, from colleagues. Uh, but uh, if I get some grant money, I think I can persuade them to join me. <laughs> grant money on has a way of changing <laughs> policy, huh? Yes. And where would you get that kind of grant money from? I, it doesn't need to be a lot. Uh, there yeah, but, are. But where, where do you even that, look? I guess is my question. Oh, okay. Um, well, I started in the institution where I study. Uh, oh, we okay. have actually a, a commercialization uh, group uh, called the, you know, uh, AUT Enterprises Limited, wh who are always kind of scanning through the the research going on at the university to see you know where some of it might actually be. You know, turned into some money-making opportunity, uh, and and they don't have a lot of money to to put behind these uh, ideas, but they have you know the seed money, um, and mm -hmm. uh, from there you go into the 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 venture community. Uh, there, there's uh, you know some a whole bunch of startup groups around here, and uh, coming from the world of finance, I'm I'm very interested in entrepreneurship, and uh, have have been to a thing called Startup Weekend. Which literally is you get you know 50, 60 people come to a, a, an office and uh, they are given the task from Friday night until Sunday night, working nonstop to come up with business plans and, if possible, actual products that would launch a, a, a small business by the end of the weekend. <laughs> wow! You yeah. come from the world of finance. Yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm an MBA and uh, was working on the trading desk at Morgan Stanley in New York before I uh, I came to uh, Auckland. <laughs> what an interesting path. Yeah. <laughs> I work for a hedge fund. Uh, I, uh, I'm a little bit like that Salman Khan guy. You know, he he had all this kind of finance stuff. Uh, uh, under his belt before he decided to get into online education. So, so is this just your retirement? Just getting a PhD in your... Uh... Yeah, my mother got a PhD at age 50 and then went on to have a, a this really great teaching career as a, a political scientist. Uh, she ran a, an internship program where she took uh, students to, to Canada to study the Canadian uh, political system in Ottawa and uh, to, uh, to Washington, D.C. So I, I, I'd sort of like to yeah, honor my my mother's. Uh, she she passed away a couple of years ago, and uh, uh, do do something for the world of uh, education. Wow, interesting. How's your transition going, Rob? Oh, it's going great. Yeah, um, you know, I and John, we I saw you at the conference, right? So yeah, that's right. Since then? <laughs> well, so let me just share. That. So the four themes of that conference. So Sloan C, you know, runs all the online learning research pretty much for higher ed. And so this was their conference. The interesting part of this conference held in San Jose, California, is there were literally people from all over the world. So first of all, that kind of blew me away. I mean, maybe because it was only like 500 people versus ISTE that was, you know, tons of people. And there were, there may have been people from all over the world at ISTE. I just didn't sit with them. <laughs> but at this conference, I sat with people from Egypt, a guy, oh, this was pretty cool. This guy presented, a professor from Norway, um, used Twitter as the main communication device for his college course. He said, I'm not using Blackboard, I'm not using email, only Twitter after I send this email out. And so through hashtags and setting up different um, interactions that way, he said he got tired of getting the same question from a bunch of students in his email, and so he thought this might be the solution. So. He found that it, it really worked well for them, and it, it met the you know the immediacy needs of you know that generation. So anyway, to that conference, and um, I'm working with uh, university professors now who are moving their courses online. So I'm kind of like an online learning coach. So that's been fun. Of course, these people are people that that I know because I when I got my doctorate, you know, I took all their classes. So and and I'm liking working from home. This is nice. <laughs> Do you, and Jeff, I forget, what is your life like? I have a day job. I teach at Pusan University of Foreign Studies. I teach in the teacher training program. 
Oh, wow. Um, so these are elementary and secondary English teachers here in Korea. So I do that as my day job, and when I'm not doing that, I'm either hanging out on the veranda with my wife or working on my various geek endeavors. <laughs> so do you make all those teachers that you train uh, use the technology? To the best of my ability. Uh, so it's a challenge there like any place. Sure, but Korea is not a bad place to tackle that challenge. Um, you know, we've got bandwidth to burn, and everyone's connected, and everyone has a good cell phone, and um, and they're you know I'm teaching a lot of thirty somethings, forty somethings. Oh, but they're you know they're willing to give it a shot. Uh, Korea is great at rapid change. Uh, and if you oh, can kind of provide uh, utility, they're willing to make that change. Mm, nice. That, in fact, that was one of the big themes of this conference. I, I guess this has been the summer for me. At the beginning of the summer, I didn't know where you know mobile learning really fit in online learning, but boy, that was a common theme at this conference. You know, and the three screens. You know, oh, and John, that must be tough for you. Is you know, you want something created for a computer, for an iPad or tablet, and for an, an iPhone. I'm thinking of the poor publishing interest, industry, you know, just wrestling with going from print to digital. Now they got to deal with different sizes of screens. Yeah, As I yeah. learned, there's all that different, you know, different technologies for different screens. It does change things pretty dramatically. And so, yeah, the, the EPUB formats are, are trying to find some way to just reflow everything. But the, the one that, that has really uh, interested me is this thing called OnSwipe. Uh, it's the, called Insanely Easy Tablet Publishing. lets you provide beautiful app-like experience for your website on a tablet. Uh, and uh, they haven't really launched. It's a sort of a invite-only, get yours kind of thing at the moment. Uh, but the... Um, uh, the demo video is just really stunning. It's, it it's gives you this um, very fluid, you know, sort of like uh, glossy magazine feel to your uh, your uh, tablet experience. So, have you heard of Inkling? Yes. Uh, How does it compare to that? Uh, let's see here. Refresh my memory. Because what's interesting about Inkling is it's the uh, investors are uh, Pearson, McGraw-Hill, the big publishing people. Yep, yep, yep. That, that has a more academic feel to it. Yeah, this OnSwipe is really meant to be, you know, your your People magazine and, and everything, oh. you know, like that. Uh, so, Got it. Uh, yep. But, and, yeah, I would expect they're pretty similar. Uh, and, and again, my real question about some of this stuff is, okay, uh, we're looking potentially at the same kind of, you know, uh, publishing model that uh, created, um, you know, Encarta, right? Yeah, and, right. And that's completely gone. So, mm -hmm. you know, why aren't we, you know, focusing now on what we know was successful in, in the world of, you know, reference materials on, on producing some kind of a collaborative authoring uh, framework? Yeah, why uh, is that, Stephen? <laughs> welcome. <laughs> um, you don't mind if I broadcast this on radio? With Not the, at all. 